Okay. So let's get started. So welcome to, to week four of seven. Um, in this week, we are talking about dictionaries and sets, and we're going to be learning about why we need to use dictionaries, why we need to use sets. We'll be comparing this to the data structures we've learned so far. So, so far we've looked at um, lists and tuples, and we've seen how to use them, how to create them, how to put data into them, how to extract data from them. And then we've also looked at, um, we've done a number of operations on them, how to add um, them together and how to uh, find items within them. There are a bunch of methods available on that. But in this week, we'll be looking at dictionaries and sets, and this gives us a lot more power. They are designed for particular use cases. So um, in, to begin with, let's just look at a, a recap of, of week three. One of the things I've talked about is the variable naming. It's very, very important that you name your variables correctly. And the reason for this is because you want to make sure that your code is readable. Um, and you'll understand this only best when it you're in a situation where you have got hundreds of thousands of lines of code and you have to keep track of what various things are. I mean, when you're, when you're writing code across multiple modules, the variable names will come in handy. And I think the most important thing, because a lot of times we think, oh, I'm writing good code so that other people can use it. But in reality, you are the number one person for whom you're writing your code. So it's important to write good variable names because you are the one who's going to need it in the future three, four, five months, a year later on, you come back to your code, you want to be able to understand what it is that you are writing about. So the variable names are very helpful. And it's just the beginning of you being able to write good functions, being able to write good classes. The way you name your variables is something that's going to apply later on. So now in this week, we're talking about dictionaries. And with dictionaries, we are going to look at how to use dictionaries. But to begin with, let's start by understanding why do we need to use dictionaries at all? Well, dictionaries are designed in, in the following way. So keep this in mind that with dictionaries, with lists, what we looked at with lists was you can put items into a list. And when you put items into a list, you and the way you can retrieve them is using an index. But in reality, if you have a large list, you do not know the index that corresponds to a particular value. That's one problem. Second problem is you can put the same item multiple times into a list. There's no, nothing that stops you from doing that. But the better way to understand the, the limitations of lists is to just crank things up and multiply the scale. So imagine if you, you have a list with 1 million items. And for simplicity, that the items in the list are not repeated. Well, in that case, then <laughs> if you had to um, retrieve a particular item, say an item that was in the middle of the list, and you don't know that it's in the middle of the list, you have to search through the whole list. Well, one shorthand, shorthand you could use is the index uh, method, but it's a, it's a, it takes long to find um, items, and especially if it's a large list. If you have to do that repeatedly, say you needed to extract a value, of, you know, 1,000 values from a list without knowing the index, then it becomes very tedious. Now, these are things in which, these are situations in which dictionaries shine. Dictionaries allow you to, first of all, have an arbitrary item that we would use as your index. So in the example that you have on your screen, you would use a triangle, the string triangle to refer to exactly the same value. The string triangle would be something, let's say you already know in advance, you can always retrieve the value of, of, of the, the corresponding value. Second is you notice that there's only one value associated with the key triangle. And that means that you'll only ever have one item associated with any key. The other reason is it's very fast to retrieve items from a dictionary. If you had a dictionary which had 1 million items, then that dictionary can, um, you can, very quickly retrieve any value because you already know the key in advance and it will be a very quick operation. So that's one of the beautiful things about dictionaries. Now let's look at some code and try and understand this. So 
this is some code that I have. I'm just going to go through step by step so that you understand what's going on. So let me start off by commenting out everything. And then we're going to, um, we'll go from the beginning till the bottom. So first of all, we're going to start by thinking about how do we create a dictionary? So we're working with dictionaries. We need to be able to create a dictionary. We need to be able to access or modify dictionaries. And there are a bunch of operations and methods that can be applied on dictionaries. So let's see what these are. So, so far, so good. Is everyone okay? Yes, so far, so good. Very good. Yeah, we are okay. Brilliant. So there are several ways to create a dictionary. One way you could create a dictionary is using the dict class. So the dict class creates a dictionary. Let's just look at that. D is equals to dict with the brackets. And if we run that, we see that D is a dictionary. Another nice way which is very handy in practice is using braces. So with braces, all you need to do is provide the key and colon and then the value. And so this is a literal way of creating a dictionary. We say it's literal because this is actually how it would print out on the screen. And if we print that, let's just have a look at that. There you go, you have a literal dictionary with triangle and circle. Now, unlike with, so with a list, you could create an empty list or an empty tuple by using the brackets or the parentheses. It's not the case with a dictionary. Though if you do use the braces, you'll end up creating something different. And we're going to see that in a short while. Another thing you could do is you could use keyword arguments. Now, if you recall in one of the classes that passed, we talked about keyword arguments when we were looking through the functions within Python and they mentioned that there are different types of arguments. So for example, with the print function, the print function takes what are called positional arguments and keyword arguments. And we distinguish between positional arguments and keyword arguments by whether they have a name or not, whether they have an equal sign or not. So if you have an equal sign, that's a keyword argument. That means that that name that's provided is a keyword associated with that variable. And we'll see how to do this later on when we look at functions how useful keyword arguments are in defining default uh, values to pass to a, a, a function. <clears throat> but in this case, we have used keyword arguments. And the most important thing to notice here is that keyword arguments are not strings. They're just keyword arguments. It's, it's a bit confusing if you're looking at this in the context of just having created a dictionary from a, the literal um, example there. But um, always remember that keyword arguments, whenever you use them in the dictionary, you, they're not going to be strings. I mean, this is something that I took me a while to figure out. But there we go. We have exactly the same dictionary with um, different, uh, with, with the same values. Now, one of the beautiful things about Python with dictionaries is that you can actually mix and match different ways of creating dictionaries. So look at this here. We have used a literal dictionary and we've used some keyword arguments and we've created a new dictionary. Let's look at what that looks like. If we run that, that creates a dictionary and it's been smart enough to distinguish between the two. So now let's look at, I'm gonna show you a new function called zip. And this is very handy whenever you're creating dictionaries. But in order for me to do that, let's, let's create two lists or two, um, yeah, two sets of values which are random. So these are actually lists. We can actually print them. So let's look at that. So if you run that, we see the keys. Those are the keys and those are the values. These are random. Every time we run this, they'll be different. Now, the zip function. So if we try running this without zip, let's just, let me comment this. And it's got too many parentheses here. Let's run that. So if you use the zip function, let's look at what it, it says in the documentation. 
the zip function, I'll just open a new one here, uh, docs.python.org library slash functions. And we're looking for zip. So let's use zip. So they tell us that zip takes an takes iterables and there's a special notation here with a star. It makes an iterator that aggregates elements from each of the iterables. So what iterables is here is whenever you see star, that simply means unpack the iterables. So if you had a list with 10 items, it will unpack the 10 items so that there are 10 individual items. So if you had um, a list with several lists inside it, it unpacks them. That's what, that's what it's telling you. Um, or these are individual iterables, okay? So let's look at how that looks like in practice. So we have keys and values. Now it told us that it gave us a zip object. Now that's not very handy, but let's, let's, do, let's cast that to a list so that we see what it, it actually looks like. So if you run that, what it has done, it has taken keys with the values three, five, one, four, one, six, and whatever, and the values, and then it's taken them and created a new list of tuples. Now, what's key to note here is that it's taken the first value from key and take it, put it with the second value, with the first value in values. It's paired them up. That's what zip does. It's like a zip, if you think about it literally. A zip has two sides and when you zip up your garment, you are taking the two sides and matching the different teeth so that they all, um, they, they hold together. That's exactly what it does. It's, it's a nice mnemonic of thinking about zipping. So what we could do is we could actually take a zipped, um, a, a set of zipped lists which have been zipped together and we can put them together with dict. So you can pass that literally, if you take that value, that list of tuples, two tuples, and pass it to a dictionary, I see what happens if you run that. Well, that creates a dictionary where the first value becomes the key and the second value becomes the, the, the value. And you end up with that dictionary down there. Now, if you can do that with a literal dictionary, you can do it with zip. And that was the whole point of showing you zip. Zip is just a handy, handy function that you can use time and time again. And I thought this would be a very nice way to, nice place to introduce the zip function. So here we have, um, we have used zip and we end up with that dictionary there. Now notice the values that we have are from what we had up here. So we've taken one, the key and four is a value and so on and so forth. Now, remember that dictionaries are not restricted to um, just having uh, numbers. You can use strings. You can use um, anything you want. In fact, let me introduce a new module here, a new package. So I'm going to import string. So there's a very nice handy uh, library called string. Let me, let me open that here. docs.python.org slash library slash string. And it's got some constants that are defined. And it's got some string formatting. You can do a lot of nice fancy things. It's got the formatting syntax. So this is if you if you wanted to read about the, I think this is a mini language, is it? It's probably, a, no, this is probably not something else. Uh, oh, this is a mini language. It's got a lot of useful things you can do with strings. But for here, for now, we're just here for these constants. We want ASCII lowercase. So let's use that. So we're going to create a new dictionary. Let's see how, let's see, this could fail, but D7, D7 is going to be a dictionary in which we're going to zip um, string dot ASCII lowercase. And we're going to zip some random values. So we could take the values that we had before. And actually, this should be interesting because it will show us what zip does. The length of ASCII lowercase is 26 because there are 26 characters in ASCII ABCD up to Z. 
and values here was not very long, it's just 10. Let's see what happens when, when we do This is going to be illustrative of what zip does. It might complain or it might find a way to, to solve this. Let's see, if you print that, aha, notice what it has done. It has taken the value A, B, C, D, all the way up to J, because we had 10. And because it didn't find anything else, that's where it stopped the zipping. It's like a zip that ends on one side. It'll only stop zipping at the point where the zip ends, where the shorter side ends. That's what it's done. And there are things you could do to make it, you know, like give it default values till the end. But I thought that would be a handy illustration to show you how zip works with a dictionary, but not just applied to numbers. So there is a dictionary with characters. Okay, so now we've been able to create a dictionary. Now we want to be able to retrieve items from the dictionary. We want to be able to access and modify dictionaries. So let's look at that. The standard way of doing this is using the, the um, exactly the same syntax using bracket to access the item in the dictionary. So let's say, for example, D7. We know D7 had characters and we want to get the value at A. So we're going to print the value at A. So if we run that now, it's, it's telling us that A doesn't exist inside D, that's because I have using the wrong dictionary, but we should be able to get that. So now we, the value eight is there. So that's how we get items from a dictionary. Now, sometimes we might want to, um, so that's typically how you do it, but let's, let's see an example which will illustrate something useful. I'm going to print D3, okay? Suppose I wanted to get the value from D3. Um, well, it turns out if you don't have a key, it raises a special exception. Last week we looked at, at exceptions being named errors. Well, key error is the named exception that you get whenever you try to get something from a dictionary with a key that doesn't exist. You get a key error and we can handle that. So here there is an example where we would handle that. We're going to use a try except. So if you remember from last week, so I'm going to comment this out and I'll uncomment this here. We're going to try and get a value three. So let's say we, we can use D6, okay. D6 might or might not have the value three, we don't know. And if it does have the value, we will see the value value with key three is, and it will show us what that value is. And then we're going to raise a key error if the value is missing. And we'd say default value is 999. So let's run that and see what we get. Ah, in this case, it says default value is 999. Uh, let's print D6 so that we actually see D6, uh, the content of D6. So D6 has got, okay, now it had the value of three. So because it had the, the key of three, we got the value three. If we run it several times, we get the value two. Now we get the value 999, which means that we had a key error. So that's one way to do it, but that's a bit verbose. We have written a lot in order just to see that little, that value of 999. A really nice way of, of handling this, Python provides the get method. Now with the get method, what that allows you to do is to specify, get the value three. If it doesn't exist, get the value, show us the value 999. So that's what get, get provides a default. You can tell it, I want a default. So let's run that. So in this case, we got the value of seven. And in this case, we got the value, uh, we didn't, the key did not exist. And we got the value 999. So we see that twice because in the first case, we got the exception and then it printed the second line. And in the second case, it just did it automatically. So what have we seen so far? We've seen how to create dictionaries. We've seen how to, um, how to retrieve items from a dictionary. We've seen how to retrieve by setting a default. And we've seen how to, um, the exception that is raised whenever we don't have the value in the dictionary. Now let's look at how to modify the content of a dictionary. Well, modifying the content is exactly the same as retrieving. It's only that we perform an assignment as we do that. So that's what the D key with value is. So I have a dictionary here called shapes. 
my dictionary has got the name triangle with a value. It could be anything. Maybe it could be the number of triangles that have been counted from something. And we've got circle, square, rectangle, rhombus, and trapeze trapezium. So let's print out that dictionary and let's look at what it looks like. So that's what it looks like, triangle and so on. And we can print, we can change the value at a particular key by specifying the key and performing an assignment. Um, so there we go. So if we, if we saw it before, let's print that twice so that we see how that looks like. So here we have triangle and um, we have square initially had a value of 3,782, but, um, oh, it's circle that we changed. So circle has changed the value 9,893 and it's now um, 555. It's that simple. We also have a method called set default. Now, before I show you set default, let's look at what happens if we don't have the key or we want to set the value. Well, let's look at, look at that. Well, if you don't have the key and you're performing an assignment, it doesn't raise a key error. What it does is it's going to just add the item. Now, an important thing to be aware of with Python dictionaries is that whenever we do insertion, we, the insertion, the order of insertion is maintained. This is very handy, especially when you look at methods like pop. So in this case, what we did is we added oval and oval was added to the end. Now, this is a feature that was added, I think, in Python 3.7. I'm not sure which Python it was. Um, but prior to the, when this was added, dictionaries were actually randomly structured. The, the, the keys and the values um, were, were randomly assorted within the dictionary. If you wanted to have order maintained, you had to use a special dictionary called an order dictionary. But now that the performance order dictionary is the same as normal dict, they just added um, that property to a dictionary by default, which is very, very handy. Now suppose we wanted to, so let's run this. We're looking for diamond. We find that diamond is not there. And surprisingly, we get a key error. Well, there's a special method that allows us to retrieve a value that's not present in the dictionary. And what it does, it will intercept the key error, add the value and return the value. So instead of having a try except around this this uh, shapes diamond. If we use shapes default and print what shapes looks like, now we don't get an exception. You notice there's no exception. But what we do, we see is we have the value added. But on this line, let's just distinguish this line here. Um, diamond as so that we can see. So shape default, unlike with the insertion operation. Say that shape default, set default will just return the value that you set. So here a value of 464 is what we had and it's added it right at the end. Another thing we can do is, so we've been able to read a value. We've been able to update a value. We've been able to insert a value. Now, what about deleting? This is usually an acronym called CRUD. I'll add it here. And you'll find it usually in the context of web applications or just typical database of operations, CRUD, which stands for create, uh, uh, read, update, and delete, CRUD. And um, once you cover those four operations, you're pretty much covered everything. Now, in order to delete something from a dictionary, we simply specify the name of the dictionary with the key, so like this. So delete and shape. And if you run that, notice now we have, our dictionary has shrunk, and that's because the value for square is no longer found. It's that simple. And with that, you now know how to use a dictionary. We've looked at membership before. Membership is always about checking whether an item is in a, in a container. And we use exactly the same method as we did, exactly the same uh, keywords as we did with uh, lists. We could check, we use the words in, and not in. 
So you'd have to provide the key for you to know whether something is in or not in. So let's look at some examples here. We have our shapes dictionary. We know we have just removed the value square, we deleted that there. And we can ask, is the square in shapes? And we just simply say square in shapes. And that will return a Boolean. What we expect it to return is false because we've, re we've removed the square key from the dictionary. We can check if oval is in shapes. We expect it to be true because we haven't modified that. But we could also ask whether something is not in. We expect to get true because we are evaluating not in. So, um, so square not in. Let's run that and see what we get. Well, there is our dictionary. And we have asked, is square in shapes? False. Is oval in shapes? True, as we expected. Is square not in shapes? Now we are, we are asking the opposite of in shapes, and we get true. And it's that simple. Um, once you learn them with one container, they're exactly the same throughout. Now, dictionaries also allow us to perform some functions or castings on them. Uh, one of the things you'd always typically want to do is get the length of a dictionary. And you do that simply with the length function. So the length function applies to all containers, whether they're lists or tuples or dictionaries. And shortly, we shall see us in sets. There is also a special function called ITA. I'm not going to show you. I can actually just show you what it prints out. So if we print ITA of shapes, it's going to show us that it, it, shows, it provides a dictionary key iterator. We can just test this or print um, uh, K for ITA shapes. Uh, this is really trivial. It's not really special print. Um, key is equals to k. If, if you run that for, oh, sorry, in. Yeah, so it just prints out. It's an iterator, it's just something for looping over, whether you're using it for uh, for, for loops or, or while loops. So, but for now, I, I, that's just what it does. In fact, you don't really need that, as we shall see shortly. You don't need that at all. We can actually cast a dictionary to a list. So if we did, uh, so if we so if we look at shapes and we look at the list of shapes, let's see what we get. So there is our shapes dictionary, and when we get the list of that, we only get the keys. If we want to get the values, we'd have to use a special method within within um, the the dictionary the dictionary class. So we've looked at a bunch of important functions, um, length, iter, and list. Let's now turn our attention to the dictionary methods and operations. I will focus mainly on the methods. The operations, you'll see them as part of the quiz and as part of the programming challenges. The first thing we're going to look at is we've seen the dict get. We've seen the set default get allows us to get and if the value is missing it will return the default and set default returns the default and um, if the value is not there um, and, and it will put the value into the dictionary so let's start off with items then items is a method let's see what it does so for example so we have shapes so i have i'll use items here if we print items it returns a dict under items, which is a special class. And if you notice the values inside that, um, inside the, the, which are used to instantiate that are a list of tuples. If you recall, this is exactly like what we would get if you did a zip. So it's like put them together as, um, as a pair of values. We typically use this if you wanted to iterate over a dictionary. So let's look at this. We would say for each key and each value, we're going to get them as pairs. And we don't have to do any special retrieval. So if we run this, we then see that sentence with the shape that's been there and the, the value 
the value that uh, was for the value there. <clears throat> Uh, if you wanted to do that literally, so suppose you didn't want to use the items, then you could you would have to retrieve the value using the retrieval, the get the get um, syntax, and that that should give you something similar. I haven't put the full string there. Okay, are we are we good? Is everyone okay? Clear? Yes. Very good. So let me just uncomment this. I'll leave this here. If you want to get the keys only, then you can use a dict keys method. And if you want to get the values, you can use a values method. So I have that here. We're printing out the values. So again, this is a special a class called dict keys and a special class called dict values. So this is how you would get the values only. If you want to get the keys only as a list, you would cast the dictionary as a list and you get out the keys. If you don't want to cast, uh, get out a list and you just want to return um, this special class called dict keys, you'd use the keys method. Now, uh, one of the nice things you could do, I've, I've shown you, um, how to we've used examples we've had strings as keys, numbers as values, numbers as keys, and numbers as values. But let's let's take uh, let's do something fancy. So, so we are creating a dictionary here, and we start by creating an empty dictionary. In this empty dictionary, we shall put values into it. Now notice here that I have used tuples as keys. So what's going to happen if I replace this with a dictionary with a, with a list. Let's just see what happens. If I use a list instead, and I run that, um, it should have, it has an exception, it's only, it appears quite far away. But here you see this is referring to line 97. So we know that this is referring to this. And it says that a list is unhashable. Basically, a list can be modified. We know that lists are mutable. We don't want mutables as keys. So you want to be able to, once it's created, it should not be changed. So that's why we would use, um, let's print that out. We would use tuples. If you have multiple items that you need as the key, or you want a, you want a container as the key, then you'd have to use an immutable data, data, data um, um, object. So that's, look at that, it's created our dictionary. We have a tuple that maps to a list. We can add a few more items, and this is going to help us illustrate a nice property, a nice method called update. So there we have our dictionary, which has got um, our tuples and our lists. And you could have the, the values, as I said, can be anything. You can have lists, you can have lists of lists, you can have lists of tuples, you can have tuples of lists, you can have dictionaries inside and that's a powerful way of creating trees if you want to um, traverse a tree very quickly you'd use a dictionary it's a very handy way of doing that uh, you could use dictionaries with you could the values could be dictionaries with lists again as in it's entirely up to you it gives you a lot of power now let's illustrate what happens with the update method the update method is very very handy so let's create a second dictionary here called fancy2 we're going to print that and look at that so we have two dictionaries Notice that fancy to, for simplicity, I'll start off um, just hiding that. They are, the, the keys, notice that the keys are different. This has 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This has 1, 2, 2, 2, okay? Now, if we run fancy, dot, if we update, we take the name of the first dictionary and we say update and we pass a dictionary Let's see what we get. So first of all, notice that the updated dictionary is longer. And that should give you an indication of what's happening here. We've basically taken the second dictionary and used it to extend the first dictionary. Well, another thing that we could do is, let's see what, what happens when you have a repeated value within the dictionary. 
So we started off with 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. 1, 1 had the value 299 and 1, 1 had the value 0, 0, 1. Now, when we did the update on line 108, we now have, let's see the value of 1, 1. 1, 1 is now different. So update, anytime you do an update, if there are keys already present, it's going to replace those ones. And if there's anything that's not found, it's going to add those ones. That's very important to understand. So with that, we have covered most of the ground on dictionaries. We know how to create a dictionary. We know how to access, how to modify. Remember, we use the acronym CRUD, create, read, update, delete. And we've looked at some operations. We've looked at, um, we've looked at how to update. Um, there are operator uh, ways of doing that using special operators. I invite you to look at the documentation. And then we've looked at how to get the keys, how to get the values, how to get items, which you can use when we are doing iteration. So that covers it for dictionaries. Dictionaries are a powerful way in which we can, as we saw from this diagram, they're a powerful way that we can use to quickly retrieve items from a container we, when we know an identity of the, of the item. So that covers it for dictionaries. Do you have any questions at this point? Any concerns, anything unclear? Okay, let's move on to sets. Now, in exactly the same way, sets allow us to solve a problem with lists. Lists, as we said, you can put different items into the list. And the, one of the problems that you would naturally have would be if you put multiple items into the list. Now, the list will not give you any complaint. It will quickly accept them. And you have a new index to access that item. So in this case, the values A and B are repeated, but they have new indices. And if you ask for the index, I think the index typically will return the first index. And, and therefore, if you want to get the second index, it just becomes so complicated. Sets allow us to ensure that the values are always unique. Just as in mathematics, sets describe a set of unique values, sets in Python are exactly the same. And in fact, that's the reason why they're there. They're actually mathematical analogs. They, you can use them to perform set operations. And we we'll look at some of these um, briefly. So we're going to look at sets, working with sets. We're going to see how to create a set. There's a special set type called a frozen set. And if you, um, you can discern anything from the name, a frozen set, unsurprisingly, has something to do with mutability. We'll see how to access and modify values in sets, and we'll see operations and methods on sets. And these are very, very handy and very, very powerful. So let's look at that now. Um, I need to, so I have a bunch of notes here. So let's first of all start off with creating sets. The simplest way you can create a set is with the set class. Print S, type S, and if we run this, it tells that S is a set, okay? That's the simplest way you can create a set. Apparently, um, so now one of the things you notice there is that unlike with dictionaries and lists and with tuples, when you print a, a set, it doesn't show you, it doesn't use the curly braces. If, I think it doesn't even show it even, even if you have items in the set. Um, it will just use a set, set name. So you look, look at this here, it says set. Now we could put some items into the set. If you want to create a, another way of creating a set is to use the braces. S1 is brace, and you could create an empty set, print S1, type S. And again, so now it shows you with the braces that this is a set, which is a bit strange. I don't know why they distinguish between the two. They're exactly the same thing, but it shows you with the, with the brace. We could have an item in the set. So you could start off with uh, a set which has some values in it. So let's say S2, or let's say, uh, let's say S2, 
is equals to, and you could put in some values, one, two, three, and we could print this two. And now it shows you with that syntax. So this is a bit confusing, actually. I don't know why they distinguish between the brace and the set class when they're exactly the same class, objects of the same class. If we do this using the set class, S3 is equals to, let's try and do it. Um, let's see what happens if we put in just numbers, one, two, three, four. This will probably fail. I'm not sure if we run that. It's going to fail because it needs one argument. And that argument has to be an iterable. So if we give it a list, it's not going to complain anymore. Now notice that now that we have put some values in and we're using the set class, it's, it's now going to uh, treat them as, as uh, use the, the braces. Now sets are mutable. You can get items from the set, you can, um, you can remove items from the set. Now, one thing to keep in mind is sets do not uh, allow indexing. So you cannot say a uh, print to the best of my knowledge. Let's see this. I, I don't think this should work. Set zero, that should fail with a type error. Set object is not subscriptable. So that's what it means by uh, accessing by index. It's using a subscript. So they're not subscriptable. Let's look at a frozen set now. So F1, let me just say frozen set and we print F1, and we should print F1 in the type of F1. So now when we, we create a frozen set, we, it's a set which using the frozen class, it's a, it's a frozen set, and we'll see that frozen sets are, are immutable. Once you create a frozen set, you can't modify it. So you have to create it with the values it will have. So let's try and modify sets. You can add items to a set. So we have S3 there. We can S3.add. I think S3 already had some items. Let's just print S3, F S3 is equal to that. Um, probably have, I have told it S3 add and I'm not giving it anything, say 27. Then we can print S3. And if we print that, you see now we've added a value to the set. I think the order of additions might be if we add something else. So let's let's use a for loop for this for some unknown. Okay, so um, for i in um, let's do it with random. So let's add some random. I like using random import random. And we use a for loop here. So we'd say random dot choices range uh, from 10 to 20, but we want 10 values. K is equals to uh, 10. Doesn't matter how many. And we are going to S3 dot add I. And then we're going to print S3. We can, let's just check to see whether the order was print I. So, so we got the value, the first value we got was 10 and we put 10 and then there's 18 was the next one. And we put 18, but notice 18 appears right at the end. So this is interesting that it actually orders them. I don't know why it does that because they're they are in order. It's interesting, I didn't know that it orders them. But you see the values were retrieved randomly. I mean, if you run that again, would we see them ordered? They are always ordered. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, so it always orders them. That, that is that is amazing. I think it I don't know why it would do that anyway. There you go. S add is how you add uh, a set dot add. In this case, S3 is a set dot add I and added items from the list. Now, if you have items in a list, you can remove them. So we can use a remove, s3.remove. Uh, we remove 27, print s3. And now we don't have 27. Let's remove something that is not present. So if you said 
S3 dot remove 99. Let's see what happens. Well, we get an exception, as you might have noticed with the red. It actually gives us a key error. So key errors are not restricted to dictionaries. So we get a key error. That's a very interesting thing. Even I didn't know that. OK, so um, there's also discard. Let's see what that does. Uh, we can look at the documentation. Why does why do we have so class set? There's a discard method. I didn't know discard remove the element from the set if it is present. So this behaves like like the the get methods on the dictionary. If you recall, they so let's see if you have s three dot remove ninety nine. And if we run that, do we still have, we still have a key error. Uh, sorry, sorry, it should be discard. So now we don't get an exception um, because the value didn't exist. So this would be to avoid key error. With membership, we've seen membership before, it's exactly the same. I'm not going to go through that right now. It's, there's nothing new here. Let's look at casting. We have a set S3 and we make a list. So we say, let's list S3 is the list on S3. And we print S list S3 and the type of the list of S3. And we run that. Well, you we see now it's made it into a list. We could do the same thing with the tuple. Um, we can also get the length of a, of a set. Uh, just as we did with the dictionary. But the interesting part with sets is the operations. Now, if you've ever heard of set arithmetic, set operations, there, 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 are, there are quite a number of things you can do with this. And Python makes it very accessible and easy to use. There are some methods that check and compare sets. So if you needed to do comparisons, you could check if two sets are, so let's do this. They could do a comparison between sets. So let's create a set S1, I'm repeating a value here. S1 is, and we're gonna do it from random.choice. We'll use them from exact choices. We'll use the same ranges. Range, and let's use some nice numbers, 100 to 115, for example. And we want to get five values. So we'll say K is equals to five. And we do the same for S2. And we print them. S1 is equal to S1. Just to be a net string. And you can S2 is equal to S2. Okay, run that. There we go. We have two different lists. We want to make sets. So we have to make sets out of this set. So now we have two sets. Okay. In, in this case, it's not very interesting. Let's let's increase the range so that we can reduce the chance of the values being okay. Okay, let's do and um, you know let's say one twenty one twenty five. We have overlaps. I'm trying to make sure we have some overlaps. Uh, one fifteen was good enough. I don't know why that. Uh, one, so okay, okay, I can leave it that. So the first thing we can do is. Ah, so if you notice, those lists are different lengths. Why are they different lengths? And the key is because these are sets. It means that one of these values, when we were creating them randomly, they repeated. So let's, let's actually increase the size of this to 10. So we can actually see it, 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 the behavior will be really nice. We can print and we can print the length here. So I'm going to print the length. Um, or I'll put the length here. So I'll put the length of S1 and S2. So I am sampling 10 items, but I'm only ending up with six and I'm ending up with eight. And because this is random, they'll, they'll keep changing. One time, one will be longer, one will be shorter. Like say now that S1 is longer. So this is a good way of testing. And it's because these are sets when we sample values from these ranges, we are, in certain cases, we're getting the same value. And therefore, because this is a set, 
that value will only occur once. That's a good illustration of sets. So let's ask some, now do some set arithmetic. Let's check if, so print that S1, F, S1 is a subset of S2. Now, there are two ways of doing this. In, 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 uh, in set arithmetic, you either have what is called a, just a subset or a proper subset. Uh, a subset means that, okay, I'll do it here. So S1 is a subset of S2, when you see that, and then we'll put um, the, the evaluation here. S1 is a subset. Uh, oh, this is what the subset, so this is subset. Uh, S2, and we'll do the same. S1 is a proper subset. I, I don't know if they use that in the documentation, I suppose. So the subset, so, so yeah, they do use that word subset, uh, just a subset or a proper subset. So a proper subset means that S1 must be smaller than S2 and has got some of the items or at least all of the items of S2. And both of these cases, I think they're not proper subsets. I mean, either subsets or proper subsets because we are sampling independently. So is S1 a subset of S2? False. Is S1 a pro proper subset of S2? False, okay? So those are the operations. Now, I would advise you to read on what those mean. Those mean. I'm not gonna explain, explain them here. I'm just gonna show you the operations. You can also do superset, um, which is sort of like the opposite. Actually, what I'm gonna do is, to, 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 to better illustrate this, I'll illustrate this with 15. And then I'm going to sample this from S1. Um, okay, good. So now, now what I've done is I have S1, I make S1 a big set, and that S1 has got various values. And then I get my values from S2 will be from S1, which means all the values in S2 will be in S1. Um, actually, in order to illustrate that, let me just reverse this a bit. And I do it that way. So, so uh, S1 then has the 15 values. No. Uh, I, want, I want S1 to be the larger one. Um, I want S1, <laughs> okay, yeah, this is tricky. Now let's just go back to what it was. Uh, go back to what it was and and I just change this now to S2. So there we need just one second. S1, and I change this. S2, S1. Because S1 is a bigger one, we want the comparison to between the smaller one, which is S2, and the bigger one, S1. So we say S2 is a proper subset of S1. So let me explain what I've just done. I am getting a bunch of values from S for S1. I'm getting 15 values, but it's a set. They'll end up being fewer than 15. And then I get my values from, for S2 from S1. That allows me to now properly check if it's a subset or a proper subset. So this one is a proper. Set operation is not subscriptable. Where have I done subscription? This is line 47. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Random the choices. Ah, okay then. Hmm. Okay. I have to cast it to a list. That should work now. So now notice that S2 is a subset, which is correct because it has the values and um, those values there. In S2, because S2 is smaller, it's both a subset and a proper subset. So now we have true because the values you have in S2 are values that are present in S1 and there are no values in S2 that are not in S1. So that's basically what a, a subset, proper subset uh, means that it is, it is definitely smaller. Subset means it could be equal. That's why we have the equal sign here. 
We could check the superset, so we could do the now the opposite. We could ask if S1 is a superset, so print F, S1 is a super set of S2. I only do this for the superset. I'll check if it's a proper superset. If there's such a term, I think there is. S1, 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 I can do S1. So it's a, S1 is a proper superset, of, so it must be greater. So S1 is greater. Uh, then S2. I think that is correct. S1 is a proper superset, let's run on. And that's true, because S1 has got more values. It's the set from which S1, S2 got its values. You play around with this and you'll, 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 you'll see if you'll have some fun. Now, we're gonna do the union. So I'm gonna create a new set here. So I'll just create a new set um, S, S um, five, and I'll do the same as I did there. Set random dot choice. Actually, let me just copy this. I'll do this twice. So I'm doing this down, and I'll name this S five. And I'll name this S six. So S five and S six are two sets. Let's look at them. So print S S five is equals to S5, then we print S6, it's S6, we run that. So that's S5, let's look at this, just add the length so that we just keep track. We know they, they are supposed to be 15, we'll almost never get 15 values, len S5. Okay, so now we have S5, which has 11 items. Every time we run it, it will be different, but there will be items that will repeat. So for example, we have the value 105, 104 is present in both, 106 is present in both, um, 113 is present in both and 114. Now let's do some set operations. So we can get a new set, which is the union of both. So S7 is the union, which is the union of S5 dot union. And there's an operator way of doing that, S6. Print S7, um, F S7 is equal to S7, and we'll also look at the show the length, the length of S7. Okay, so what do we notice? Well, we notice, so there's several values that were repeated, but if you count the number of unique items, the union brings, takes both sets together, combines them, and we'll only remain with the unique values. Let's just double check that. We have 100, 101, 102, so that's another unique value. One, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, there is nine, 10, and it should be 11. I'm probably counting wrong, but anyway, Python has done that correctly. We have 11 items in the union. S7 is a union, so let's call that this right there union. You can also do this using the union operator. So you can print um, S5, and which is a pipe S6. And that should give you exactly the same. Anytime you see that, you see the values are exactly the same. We'll, we'll do the method versions of these first. Another very important thing that you need to do with sets is the intersection. So we'll create S8. Let's see what an intersection is. S5 intersection S6. Um, we print out uh, F intersect of is S8 and it has a length. Also oh, the union is what's everything that is uh, combined. I think that's uh, why my counting came wrong. <laughs> uh, the length of S8. Okay, so if you do the intersect, now the intersect, so that's S5 and S6, the intersect is the values that are common to both. So that's an important thing. If you have two sets, you want to find what's common between two, these two sets. It's basically like two circles. Um, you see this on a Venn diagram. You have two circles and where they overlap is their intersect. That's, that's how we should think about it. The intersect is what's common to both. Um, common 
to go. Uh, or let's say occurs in the and the union is here we are saying it is um, just combined, just a combination. You can actually do differences of sets. So we have S9 is S5 difference and S6 can print F difference is equal to S9. And you can see the length of S9. Um, let's see what that looks like. Um, I'm going to print S5 and S6 here so that again, so that we can see them. S5, S6. So look at S5, that's S5. And we're saying we're getting the difference. The difference means find out everything that is in the second list, the second set, and remove them if they are also present. It's sort of like saying, um, whatever is in the intersect, take it out of this set. So what you want to end up with is all the items that were not present in the second list. So the second, second set, we didn't have 100, we didn't have 102, and we didn't have 103. But we had 101. Uh, uh, one. Uh, no, 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 no. Let's take out what is common actually, sorry. So we have whatever remains is 100, 102, 103, okay, but 104 is common. Yeah, take out what's common, sorry, take out what's common. But the direction of difference matters. So this is a difference S5 and S6. If you had a difference S10, which was S6 difference S5, the result will be totally different because, um, Let's do one. It's ten. It's very different because now we are doing starting off with S six, and we are removing all the things that were. So like here we have a hundred, but one one, we had one or two. So we get rid of one or two because one or two was in the second set. There's also symmetric difference. I'll leave you to exp ex experiment with that. Uh, you can do copy, you can do pop, you can do clear. Those are pretty straightforward. You can also do an update. Uh, you can do an intersection update, a difference update, and all these are in the do documentation. You can do a symmetric difference update. So I'm going to leave you for, for, for this to you, for you to experiment. There are also some of the questions in the quiz, some of the questions in the, the programming challenges will touch on these. So I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, so that covers it for this class. Um, oh, we haven't looked at frozen sets and operations. So let's just do that quickly. So if I had a frozen set, I made a frozen set, F was a frozen set. Let's try and um, apply some of the operations we've learned. So if we try to say F dot add a number, let's see what happens. Well, we get an exception, and the exception is because frozen set has no attribute add. So once you create a frozen set, it's fixed. So if you want to create a frozen set with values, you have to provide the values in advance. So you'd have to provide, so in, in this case, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, and print frozen set is F. And that means, uh, so there's our frozen set. And we can't do a difference. We can't do difference operation. We can actually. And the only thing is, anytime you perform these operations, you, you will be creating a new frozen set. So for example, if F, that's F, and we have F1 is frozen set from range 10 to 15. We print F, we print F1, and you do that. We see that F1 is that. If we got the union of F and F1, now, so if you said print and we say the union, it's going to be F, 
Um, I think you can use a plus operator. No, 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 it's a pipe, sorry. F, F1, this is the operator version of that. Actually, let's make a variable out of this. So we're going to say F2 is that. I'm going to print that. So if you do that, we get a new frozen set. So anytime you do operations on frozen sets, you still get a frozen set, um, but you don't modify the original frozen set. I think that covers everything for working with dictionaries and sets. So just a recap, we've looked at dictionaries. We looked at why dictionaries are, why they, are, they have been created. We've also looked at why sets exist. We've explained the roles that each of these play. Um, and that's it for this class. Now I have created a, a test for yourself. You could run this, uh, go through this. I can copy and paste this in the, in the, Actually, I have, I have it here. So I'm going to stop the recording now and then we're going to just have a brief discussion. So let me stop recording. Uh, stop recording.